And Father, I thank You for doctors. I thank You for the people You have given the knowledge to, to find and deduce things and to fix things. But Lord, right now, we're going to call that cancer to go away in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, we declare healing over her body. Father, we're declaring something good is about to happen right here. And that, Father, let it be for Your glory and honor and let it be a testimony as that God still moves on His people at Maxdale. And that, Father God, we're praying the prayer of faith. We've got her surrounded. And Lord, we're going to believe right now for healing of this thing. We're going to declare that esophagus to be healed. We're going to declare the mass is gone. We're going to declare absolute healing for her. And Lord God, a long, good life without any, any kind of uh, uh, hiccups or reparations, Lord God. So, Father, we're just going to leave Becky in your hands right now. And, Lord, as you're touching her body, touch her mind as well. Let her mind be at peace, Lord God, because her hope is in you. And that, Father, you undergird her and her family during this, during this time. Lord, we lift all of these needs that were mentioned here today. And that, Father, we are speaking to the bodies of those that are needing physical touches. And, Lord, we just declare right now, healing still happens. And we declare healing to be happening in our houses, Lord God. We're going to declare for healing in our minds and our hearts from the troubles, the depressions that we have. Father God, we're going to declare right now that you're providing finances and jobs for those that are needing it. We declare right now, Lord God, that you are creating open doors and avenues for us to impact people spiritually so we can see the lost saved because that's what this church is about. And so, Father, we want to see them saved and growing in you. And so, Lord, give us every open door and opportunity. We do pray for those that are going to be traveling. And, Lord God, let there be traveling mercies for as different ones. Even I go on vacation, Lord God, give us all safe trips coming and going because, Lord, there's still more to do. And, Father, we're just going to pray right now for refreshing. Come on, somebody agree with me right now. Let there be refreshing in the house of God. Let there be refreshing in your people. Let there be refreshing in our own homes. That, Lord God, we can be refreshed in your presence on a daily basis. And Father, we're going to lay all these needs at your feet right now, giving you glory and honor and praise for the testimony that's going to come. And Lord, we're going to give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name. Somebody said amen. 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 Did somebody take my glass of tea? Ooh, you better just come on down the altar and get saved. If you... It is? Yep. I thought you were going to say you found my tea. That was the most, that was the most underwhelming conversation I've had all day. I was like, woo <laughs> Alright. So, turn with me and you buy it. Hang on, I got to put my glasses on so I can hear you. What? No, I'm good. I've got some stagnant water down here. It'll be fine. I mean, I think I've been working on this bottle for two months. So, I don't see nothing floating in it. So, mm. oh, that's good. Oh, hallelujah. Fermented just right. So, we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 4. While you're turning there, let me make just a few announcements. Have you all enjoyed all the tacos and burritos and tamales and woo, glory? I was ready to fight the Alamo all over again. It was good. The uh, but we do want to say a very special thank you to all the folks that bring food. Because listen, if it's one, and we've had this before where it's one or two people bringing some food and 80, 80 people showing up to eat, and you can only add so much water to the pot and still call it soup. Okay. So thank you, thank you, thank you for those that have been bringing food, bringing desserts. Thank you very much. Brother Mike, I don't know what to bring and I don't know how to cook anything. Stop by Walmart or HEB and grab a jug of sweet tea, okay? You'll be a hero to a lot of folk. I, I, I went in there, um, we, were, we were doing the re, sort of rearranging things in the foyer and we had ordered some pizza for those that were here working. And I went in there and got a glass of tea. Unsweet tea. 
I lost my victory right there. It's like, that's like kissing your sister. It, mm-mm. Mm-mm. And I, I thought this is the most tragic thing I've ever put in my mouth in a long time. And uh, so if you're if you're in the habit of bringing dirty water, don't. <laughs> now, now, there are some people that like unsweet tea, and I respect your opinion. But uh, for the 98% of the rest of us, sweet tea is the way to go. Um, let's see. Next, now, next week is sandwiches. All right. So y'all bring stuff that goes with that. We do have quilting ministry. It's going to be taking place on tomorrow, Thursday at 6. Friday, we got game night. We've got a couple different things going on. <clears throat> game night going on at uh, uh, food at 6. Food at 6, and then all the gambling takes place. And then at 6.30, the crafting ministry is going to be happening. And uh, those of you that saw the American flag out there with the little hearts, is that what y'all are making? All right, so if you want to come be a part of that, uh, Leslie and Sharon, these are the, is it y'all two? All right, these are the heads of wisdom for our crafting. So y'all come by and see them. Uh, refreshments are provided because how do you know church is better when you eat? Glory. We're into the full gospel ministry, okay? So... Y'all come out for that and uh, have a good time with the crafting. Crafting and game night on Friday. And uh, and then, how do you know what happens Sundays at 9.45? Used to be a song. Everybody ought to be in Sunday school. Yeah, you don't like the song either. But we have great Sunday school classes. Y'all need to come out and be a part of them. There's a ton of sign-up sheets out there in the lobby. One of them is for a new class. Craig's going to be starting how to study your Bible. And uh, sometime in September, you can sign up for that. There's 40 other sign-up sheets out there. Go sign up for everything. We do have the youth fundraising night. It's going to be on Saturday, next Saturday, the 17th. And uh, bake sale, car wash, garage sale, all kinds of things. So if there's something you could do, you could add, you could bring, uh, uh, be sure to talk to Pastor Michael um, or Bubba Parrish. And uh, uh, we want to we wanna try to raise as much money for teenagers as is possible. All right. Anything I missed? Good. We're done. All right. So did anybody ever see the movie Ocean's Eleven? Okay, now for most people, you would consider the George Clooney version in 2001, but how do you know the Rat Pack did it back in 1960? I did not know this. And, uh, but Ocean's Eleven, the bank robbers and casino robbers and, and all that sort of thing, before there was Ocean's Eleven, there was a guy by the name of King Leonidas. And I'm not talking about Sparta or anything like that. George Leonidas Leslie was an architect from Ohio who needed to rebuild his life. This was during the time, he was a young man during the time of the Civil War, and he had a soiled reputation because he wouldn't go fight. And uh, so um, fight for the right side, fight for the wrong side, just go fight. But uh, as much as you may have hated the other side, what you hated more was the coward. And uh, here's the man, he would not fight, so he got branded as a coward. And after his parents died in 1867, it forced George to <clears throat> liquidate all the family assets to make ends meet. And uh, so he moved to New York City by himself, uh, with hardly a penny to his name, just to start his life over. Now, the city in New York back in that time was overcrowded. Uh, crime was real high, <laughs> kind of like it is right now. Um, did I offend anybody by saying that? We're from Texas. Okay, I just check it. I'm just making sure. Did anybody like the foyer, what we've done so far with the foyer? Okay. So just so you understand, we tried to make all the seating down here and uh, so we're not wasting any seats. You can get coffee. You can come sit down here, chairs, the pew, all that sort of thing. We got the greeting desk and, and uh, the chuck wagon with the cups up here, kind of trying to create some room in there, and, uh, but especially to, to have our welcome station there at the very front. 
So if you liked it, we're going to just keep going. Uh, uh, I did get a few naysayers, and your opinion does not count. But <laughs> no, no. Uh, if you don't like it, that's fine. Tell me you don't like it. And if you do like it, that's fine. Tell me that you like it. I'm just going to do whatever Lynn says. I'm telling you right now. So, but um, no, the the corrupted politicians and the police officers that were there in New York, they made it uh, hard for justice, but easy for crime. And uh, so the gangs were literally running over all of that area. Not long after his arrival, Leslie fell into uh, the criminal lifestyle of the gangs. And uh, seeing how his college degree and his skill set that he learned was a huge benefit actually in robbery, uh, Leslie envisioned a crew of thieves that would be unstoppable. He, being an architect by trade, he would use those skills and uh, to rob banks, and he quickly rose to the top of the ranks of the criminal world there in the New England area. So Leslie formed his own gang of skilled bank robbers early in his criminal career. And uh, he was the mastermind of the gang, and it was his job to research and plan all the robberies. Uh, all the places that were going to get hit, his job scouted out, and this he would take his time. He'd do a year. He'd take a year just to watch the ebb and flow of everything. And uh, uh, his associates would follow his instructions to carry out the job, and his gang robbed a lot of banks over the years. From the time Leslie arrived in the East in 1878, it was estimated that Leslie and his gang were responsible for 80% of the bank robberies in America. Think about that. So the most famous robbery that they pulled off happened to be their last one. And it was of the Manhattan Savings Institution robbery in, the, in October of late 1878. And, uh, and it took Leslie three years to plan the robbery using blueprints and building repli he built replica vault scenes in a warehouse in order to practice uh, on duplicate safes. Just like if you saw Ocean's Eleven, that's where they got that idea of rebuilding the bank interior inside a warehouse so they could practice. This is where they got the idea from because uh, uh, Leonidas uh, actually did this. And so the teams always wore disguises and they never met together in public. So on the downside, Leslie became intimate with one of his associates' wives. How do you know that's a bad thing to do? So he got caught, and he got dead because of it. And, uh, and he, they, he was killed right before the bank heist took place. But the team had been, now this is what's crazy, the team had been so efficiently schooled on how to attack that bank, on what to do, uh, and they had practiced, and so they stuck to the plan. And in October of 1878, they pulled off one of the greatest bank robberies in history. They got away with, $2.5 million in cash, which is the equivalent today of about $30 million. And I don't know that any of them ever got caught. It was that well planned and performed. And so this is the legacy of a man, while it's not a great legacy, uh, not one you want to brag about necessarily, but this is the legacy of a man who believed in what a team could do. He knew that if everybody knew their position, knew their thing, if everybody worked together for that greater good of what's going to happen, anything is possible. Anything is possible. All you got to do is look back in the Bible when they were building the great tower of Babel. And what did the Lord say? There's there of one mind. There's not anything that could stop them from doing whatever they wanted, and so God had to mess up their languages just to just to put them down a notch. So while this bank robber knew the value of the team, the apostle Paul did too. When when Paul wrote the majority, now he wrote the majority of the New Testament including several books known as the prison apostles. That would be Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon. These four he wrote while he was in chains. And uh, while he was in jail, and after writing a letter to the Colossian church, Paul had a spiritual epiphany 
about the church. God began to show him things that nobody else had ever seen. God was revealing them to Paul so Paul could reveal them to mankind. And what Paul saw was this, that the church was a living body of growth and productivity. The church is a body of growth and productivity. The church is also God's weapon against evil powers. Growth and maturity, productivity, and then overcoming the enemy. That's what the church is, that's what every church is supposed to accomplish. How do you know not every church accomplishes that? But this is what the church is supposed to do. Grow you, make you productive, let this church make a difference, and at the same time, keep darkness at bay. Keep the devil out of our town, out of our families, out of our homes. If a church is doing it right, people are winning and the devil are losing. Well, in Ephesians, uh, uh, scholars, when I was going through seminary, we were studying Ephesians, and it was called the, this one particular book is called the Alps of the New Testament, the Grand Canyon of Scripture, and the Royal Capstone of the Epistles. Scholars really love the book of Ephesians a lot more than the rest of them. And, and what's, what's cool about this book is it, un, it unveils the mysteries that God now made known to mankind regarding who we are in Christ and why we're here. It had been a mystery up to this point, but now it's as if God said, okay, it's time. Get your pen ready, Paul. I got something to say. I've been waiting to say this. So when you're reading the book of Ephesians, that's what you're getting is this exciting download God wanted to give Paul so he could give to you so you would know this is what all that was about. So this is what you're going to see here is because we look at it, it was like all oh, the book of Ephesians, you know, spiritual warfare. That's all we know about Ephesians. Ephesians 6, spiritual warfare. There's so much more to it and you have to understand this was a divine cutting edge revelation. When Paul was writing this and it was being circulated around churches and they're reading it from the pulpit, here's the latest teaching from the Apostle Paul. Oh, let's hear it. And they begin to hear things they have never heard before. It was that mind-blowing. Okay, And so in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9, we see this. Paul says, He, God, may known to us... Now pay attention to that part the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Christ. God has now made known to us the mystery of His will. What that mystery was, was this. It's three things. Number one, was to form a body that mirrored Christ reaching the world. We are to be reaching the world just as Christ wants to reach the world. And so that is our job. That as a body, we're doing the work of Jesus Christ. He's saving the world, but He's saving the world through us. Secondly, the mystery of the will was that in order to do this work, it had to happen by the uniting of peoples, Jews and Gentiles into one body, among whom God Himself would now dwell through the person of the Holy Spirit. This is revelation knowledge right here. I mean, this is... Rare to, uh, taught stuff because if you're a Jew, you don't have nothing to do with the Gentiles. Nothing. What are the Jews and the Gentiles? If you're a Jew, you're a Jew. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. And so God said, I want everybody to be a part of my family. Not just the Jews, but the Jews uniting with the Gentiles to make this happen. And so He was saying that the church has got to reach the world. How does the church reach the world? By everybody becoming one. How do you know that's not easy to do? You could tie, take two cats, tie their tails together, throw them over a clothesline. You're going to have togetherness, but you're not going to have unity. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So unfortunately in churches... We got people who will come together, but they will not be unified. Do you understand that everybody in this building is your brother and sister in Jesus Christ? Well, not that devil over there. I don't want nothing to do with it. 
we, we are the body of Christ. And we have to be able to love each other, work with each other, be with one another. Because if you don't like it, you're not going to like heaven. If you make it. Just saying. Just saying. So the mystery of the will to form the body that mirrored Christ to the world. But then it does this by uniting the people into one. And third, the church is to equip, empower, and mature this people so that they can extend this victory over evil throughout every age, get this, until Jesus comes back. The church has got to be successful every day until Jesus gets back. Why? Because we're Jesus. We're the Jesus in this world. He works through us. These are His hands. Look at your fingers right there. Make, make, some, make some sparkle fingers right there, okay? These are the hands of Jesus Christ. And if you don't be used of Him, whose hands will He use? Because see, you're God's plan A, and there is no plan B. And so the, 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 the mystery of the will was that God said, I want... I want everybody reached and we're all going to do this together and it's going to happen because you're a part of a church that is helping you to be equipped, empowered, and matured so you can have victory over the evil one until Jesus Christ comes again. So literally, this is the message. When you're reading Ephesians, this is a message that throbs through the book and personally in the heart of Paul. I'm, I'm telling you, get some brownies and some coffee. Go back and reread that and see if you can feel the pulse in the veins of Paul when you're reading this. This is an exciting word for him. Fresh downloaded from the throne of God. And it's a magnificent goal of Jesus saying that he is going to build a glorious, mature, and thriving team to win the world with. That's his goal. Understand when Paul wrote this, it wasn't happening. But this is the design that we're now going to build from. And he's excited because this is what God wants. The, a new revelation, never seen. And we see the culmination of this further down in chapter 4. So in Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 1, it says this. This is the picture of being one. Again, this is God's ultimate goal. Be one. Love God, love others. Love God, love others. We're one. Okay? As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be completely humble and gentle. Be completely humble and gentle. I'm going to keep saying it just so many of y'all get it. I'm going to look at you like my dog looks at me. <laughs> Wait for you to get it. Be humble and gentle. Be patient. Oh, bearing with one another in love. <laughs> How do you know it takes a little more bearing for some than others? Hallelujah. But I can promise you this. It's worth it. It's worth it. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the what? The bond of peace. I would, I would highly recommend that somebody do some very good word searches on that piece of Scripture right there. Verse number 3. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond. The bond. Look at what that means. The bond of peace. We're going to have peace and so we're going to have unity in the house. There is one body and one spirit just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God, the Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Only the Holy Spirit could bring this unity out of natural selfishness and competition. Natural selfishness and competition. If you don't believe me, go look at the churches in our area. Look at churches that will not associate with other churches because they're afraid those other churches are going to steal their people. Dear God, help us. When did our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ become our competition? Are you hearing me? 
That's unfortunately a very real thing in the world today. I'm talking to you out of knowledge. That's a very real thing where you don't just keep up with the Joneses. you got to keep up with the Joneses' church. So only the Holy Spirit is the one that can make that. He changes us so that we will work together. That, that, that we're able to put up and tolerate each other. Only God can do that. Now let's keep going. Ephesians 4, starting in verse 7. This is God gave gifts to the body. This is God's first gifts to the body. All those spiritual gifts, all that other stuff, that all comes in a later segment. This right here, though, this is God's first gift to the church. Look at this. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when He ascended on high, He took many captives, and He gave gifts to His people. Now remember, this whole time He's talking about the church. Remember the context in which it's being read. So He's saying right here, He gave gifts to His people where? In the church. This is what it's about. So Christ gave Himself, Christ Himself gave as gifts to the people, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers, to equip His people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become, what's that word? Mature. That we all become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, I want to give some definition very quickly to these spiritual roles that were that were talked about right here. So everybody knows what an evangelist is. If you've been around the church for a while, you know what an evangelist is. Evangelists are bringers of good news sent to save souls and present the gospel message. Okay, uh, They have a, an ability to touch hardened hearts with God's love for those individuals to receive salvation. The marks of an evangelist are people getting saved healings and miracles happening. How do you know you don't have to be in a Pentecostal church to see miracles take place? It ought to be happening. Matter of fact, go back and read the Bible. These things shall follow them who believe. Okay? That has no denomination on there. It's, it's If you're a Christian, a child of God, these are the things that ought to be following you in your life in God. Now, the evangelist, what we have today is pretty much more what we know of as a revivalist because you don't get a you don't necessarily get a whole lot of people saved at a revival kind of like you used to years ago. Uh, a lot of your unsaved people don't they don't go to revivals, church people go to revivals. And so you instead of an evangelist you have a revivalist. I am a firm believer that all five of these gifts should be in every church. Every church. So who is the evangelist at Maxdale Cowboy Church? It should be all of us. Now, but understand some are better at it, some are more gifted at it. We all should be doing something to make Jesus know, okay? But have you ever met some people? I mean, it's like they just look for every opportunity to talk to somebody about Jesus. It could be the clerk at the grocery store. It could be the waitress at the restaurant. It, it, could, it could be the, the guy riding by, by on his 10 speed. Uh, it could be the Mormon outside the post office. Oh, you remember that downtown Colleen years ago. It don't matter where they go. It's like they're on a hunting expedition 24-7. I got to find somebody to tell Jesus. Let me tell you something. That is the mark of a true evangelist. And I thank God for them. Because they, they love to get out there and tell people about Jesus. Uh, I am an introvert. I don't like people. <laughs> i got to be careful saying that. I, now listen, i got to be careful saying that because I, I, Brother Mike, somebody may want to talk to you, but you're saying you don't like people and somebody may not come talk to you. Listen, I actually do great one-on-one. -on -one. I do. And, and, and I'm, a, I'm a good counselor. Uh, my wife and I do a lot of counseling. I, I do love people. I do love people. Uh, so when I say that, I am joking. I, does everybody understand that? Okay. 
If I've offended you, congratulations, your time is over. Now we're going to the next person. So I, I got to get everybody done this year. So that's a lot of offense got to take place. So bear with me. So that's the evangelist, okay? Now God says, I give you a pastor. Now the pastor is the nurturer. They're the healers of the broken. They, are, they give oversight to make sure the needs of the people are being met and the apparatuses are working inside the church. The word pastor is only used one time in Scripture. One time in Scripture. However, it's the thing that we've made the primary function of the church today. I will tell you that in the early church, the pastor was a part of the church. He had his job. But it's not exactly quite like what we, what we have as the pastor today. Pastors are most effective one-on-one -on -one and in modeling Christ. Pastors are not preachers. Do you understand that? What is a preacher? One who preaches. Ooh, I want to say something right there. If I was a tacky man, if I was tacky, okay, I would say there's a lot of women fit that category, but I'm not tacky, so I don't say that. Do you hear me? Exactly, I didn't hear it. No, the uh, a preacher, a preacher is a preacher. They stand behind the pulpit and they preach. How do you know that's not pastoring? That's preaching. It's a part of what a pastor does, but it's not everything that a pastor does. Okay, so. Uh, they're all the pastors are always given to a set group of people for leading, loving, and assisting as a link between the people and other offices. Okay? Now, third is the teacher. The teacher is one that stirs others to know the truth. More than explaining, it carries an anointing that brings change. When they teach, they're teaching you towards change. They're teaching you towards knowledge that is making you wiser, more mature, growing, and it causes changes in how you live, act, and see God. Teachers love truth and they love to study. They love to study. If they don't love to study, they're not very good teachers. Why? Because you can't teach. Hear me. You can't teach what you don't know. Well, I heard T.D. Jake say this, so I'm going to teach that this week. I would rather you have a word from God than something that is convenient. Are you hearing me? The church needs good teachers. They're avid readers and they study topics in multiple ways, explaining things from many different angles so that the person is sure to understand because a teacher wants everybody to get it. One of, I'm a teacher, and I love seeing these guys that are teachers, ladies that are teachers. You know what I'm talking about. When you see that light bulb come on. You know, they get that look on their face. I get it. Oh, that's satisfying. A, a teacher loves that aha moment because it means you're getting it. Now, the last two we're going to talk about is... is you don't hear about them much. You don't see them much. As a matter of fact, there are those that say they don't even exist today. And I will tell you that's not true. Because in which this word was written, it is a, it's an expounding word of continuous action. It's not one and done. There will be apostles. There will be prophets. There will be pastors. There are some who believe the apostle died with Jesus. No. No. Those were the first of the apostles. An apostle is sent with a message and a specific assignment and mandate given by God directly for a specific people, a specific cause, and a purpose directly concerning the kingdom of God. These are the big picture people. These are the ones that are actually creating the blueprint of what needs to happen, at a, say, at a church. Okay? More than just teaching, they're the ones that are creating and making these things happen. These are the writers of books, the establishers of schools and trainings, and they have put in place dynamics that continue to expand and grow when they are no longer around. It just keeps going. Kind of like, kind of like the bank robber. He's no longer around, and yet the plan went off without a hitch. Why? Because apostolically speaking, he put together a good plan. Now don't say Jesus told me to rob a bank. He did not, but if you do, pay your tithe. Okay. <laughs> now, 
An apostle is a risk taker. And they're a pioneer. A risk taker and a pioneer. And they set things in order and maintain spiritual flow. Uh, an apostle loves to start and create things. Start and create. They want to see new ministries. They want to see new things. They want to see new churches. They, they have this vision that everybody else is like, man, we just want to go to church on Sunday. We want to sing, hear a sermon, and go home and eat fried chicken. And the apostles say, no, there's more. There's more to this. And so that's what the apostle does. The apostle oversees. He's the one that, that, that while the pastor's at the church, he's out there seeing what to do next. Those still exist. And I believe they ought to be in every church. Every church. Then number five is the prophet. The prophet speaks from revelation, the heart of God in a matter. It's not by perception, but by inspiration. It's not, the prophet doesn't say, well, you know what? I'm watching the news. I'm seeing this. I think this is what's going to happen. No, that's not what prophecy is. Prophecy is God saying, thus says the Lord. This is going to happen. And these are the signs that these things are going to happen. Uh, a prophet, they, they are foretellers and revealers of the intentions of God. Whatever it is God wants to do, He tells a prophet first. Oh, wait a minute. That's Scripture. It says that before God does anything, He first tells His people, the prophets. And so prophets have a, a head start, if you will. Here's what God is up to and God trying to do. It's interesting. If you go back and reread 1 Corinthians 14, I think it's in verse 1, Paul says, I would that you had all the gifts, but especially the gift of prophecy. Now the gift of prophecy and the office of the prophet, as talking here, is they're alike, but they're two totally different things. You can work in the gift, but you're not necessarily in an office. Okay, But I believe that... that, that Everyone, every church ought to have the apostle, the prophet, the teacher, uh, uh, the pastor, and the evangelist. Prophets teach people how to hear God for themselves. Now, let's draw this to a close. There's actually six different ones mentioned here. I mentioned to you these five, but there's a sixth one that's mentioned in this scripture right here. You have the five offices, but then you have the people that are being trained for the work of God. Guess who that is? That's you. That's the church. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 11. So Christ Himself gave as gifts to the people, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers, to what? To equip His people for works of service. Oh, wait a minute. When you hear Pastor Mike say from this pulpit, if this is your home church, then you need to have a job in it. That's not Pastor Mike. That's Ephesians chapter 4. For God gave these people in order to equip you for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up and we all reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. So you see, every one of us have a part to play. Every one of us have something to be doing right here. Which one are you? Now understand, God calls of the five, He'll call them right out of the, out of the, the pew. Had a man named Tracy. Third pastor, third church I ever pastored. First one in Arkansas. We were in uh, Pottsville, Arkansas. Had a man who stopped by the church, done time in the pen. He, he'd been out of the pen for a couple years, got put up for uh, making and distributing methamphetamines. Did time in the big house. Big house. He came by. Brother Mike, my name's Tracy. I think God wants me to go to church here. Man, I was trying to rebuild that church. They're about to close the doors. I said, amen. I believe it is too. <laughs> I'll find out if you're worth keeping or not. But right now, yes, you need to be here. I need every warm breathing body I can get. Developed a close relationship with this man and his wife. And uh, Tracy... Tracy was not an educated man. I don't know that he made it all the way through high school. He worked at a railroad tie plant. Very simple man. But he loved God. And he learned how to hear God. That man would come to me on Sunday morning and he would come to me and say, 
Brother Mike, you're me right now. <laughs> Brother Mike, God told me such and such and such. Without knowing that last night in my recliner, God had been telling me almost word for word the exact thing. That man did not call himself a prophet. How do you know if you've got to call yourself that, you're probably not. What's the old saying? If, if a woman has to tell you she's a lady, she probably isn't. Anybody remember that one? Okay. If you got to tell me you're a Christian, I can't. Was playing golf and, and walked up on these four guys that were just destroying the golf course. Four older men, they, they, Billy, they weren't on your team. They, these guys were duffers. They were they were digging trenches, cussed up a storm. Young man, put your bag in my cart. You can just ride with me. Blankety blank 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 blank. I mean, they just they they. You would think that was their wind power for swinging their arms. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, I was not. But uh, as it happens, we get to one tea box and they say, Well, tell us, young man, what do you do for a living? <laughs> well, I happen to uh, pastor such and such church. Guess what? All four of them were deacons. <laughs> If I'm lying, I'm dying. They suddenly got their religion straight <laughs> when they found out this young man with us is a bona fide pastor. Woo! That's humorous, but it's one of the saddest things I ever watched. You don't have to tell somebody you're a prophet. It just flows out of you. You don't have to tell people you're, you're an evangelist. It just is who you are. Amen. I don't go around telling people I'm a pastor, just not that I'm ashamed of it. I wouldn't be doing it this long if I was ashamed of it. But I want my life to speak the words where somebody can walk up to me and just say, you a man of God, aren't you? I want them to say that. These gifts operate. And God calls, just like Tracy. I believe that man was the closest thing I've ever met to an Old Testament, New Testament prophet. That man could hear God. I have seen apostles. I have seen prophets. I have seen the teachers. I mean teachers that just make you... I mean, they could teach for two hours and you feel like you're there 15 minutes. You're just glued to them. It's just like the words coming out of their mouth is just gold nuggets. I've met them. And odds are you have too. That when I explain these offices, somebody comes to your mind, you'd say, you know, that reminds me of old brother so-and-so. Teacher, whoo! Old sister, watch her bucket, man. She, <laughs> she could teach. Man, she could teach. I remember when I, growing up in the Methodist church, you'd have people show up for Sunday school and then cut church. We talked about that. They got more out of Sunday school than they did the preacher sermon. Woo, Jesus. So here's the thing. King Leonidas was smart as a thief, but he could not accomplish his plans by himself. Can I tell you, we as a church cannot accomplish the plans of God off of just one man. It takes more than this. It takes us to do it. Because I'll tell you, there's some people, they'd like, he's all right. But I really come here because I enjoy the worship. Or I come here because I got friends here. Or I come here because they got cinnamon rolls and tacos. <laughs> <laughs> Sunday morning. Sunday morning, not tonight. The uh, So here's the thing. Be a church where we're all involved because I really do believe this. I do believe this. We are better together. Do you know where we're not good? 
is when somebody won't be part of the team. It's got to be my way. It's got to be my thing. I, I, I am the stick that goes through the bicycle spokes. You ever had that happen? Oh, that's horrible. I mean, you'll go tail over nose over the handlebars. And I've had that happen before. The last thing the church needs is to be going blazing down the path of God and somebody tries to be a stick in the spoke. It just gums up everything. Go back and reread the very first part of Ephesians 4. Unity, closeness, love, patience. Being these things with one another. Because I'll tell you, if you can't be that, you won't be that. So God makes a good team. Would you agree with that? God knows what He's doing. Me personally, I like the team we got here. I think we got good people in this church. Look at the person sitting next to you and say, he's talking about me. It's okay. <laughs> Go ahead. You're welcome. I sat by you tonight. What I want to see is, okay, God, so where are you taking this church? What is it you'd like to see, Lord? Versus what Mike Sullivan wants. What Billy Smith wants, Billy Curb wants, you know, Todd. And it, versus what our plans may be. What does God want to do? What is your idea? What is your plan for this, Lord? That's what I want to see. So bow your heads with me. And Lord God, I want to say thank you for Maxdale Church. Father, I... There's not much we could do. We pray for a different church every week because we do care about churches and we want to see churches grow. We don't want to be the only one that's being blessed by you. Lord, we want everybody to be blessed by you. But we're only accountable for us. So Lord, we pray over our church tonight. And God, I pray that you would help us to be the body of Christ that this church needs for such a time as this. This church hasn't always existed. It has not always been around. There are very few uh, uh, m people, members, that were here when it first started 16, 17 years ago. You have brought every one of us from different places, different states, you brought us from all over to this place for such a time as this. And the question is, is why, God? Why on earth would you do that? I got to believe it's because, Lord, you've got a plan. You've got something that you're wanting to do. And you looked around and said, these are the people that will get it done in that church. So, Father, I pray, help us. Search this church, God. Come on, somebody agree with me right now. God, search this church just like we would ask for any other church. Search this place and find the things that are not right. Find the things that are not healthy. Find the things that are not good. And, Lord, You change them. And then find the things that are good. And, God, let us be blessed at what we're doing. Help us to grow better and better and better in You. That You have Your way. You do Your work, Lord God. Because we want Your kingdom come and Your will done right here. Watch over us, Lord. Lead us as we leave this place. I pray that You would help us to be in love with this church. That, Father, in, instead of having negative things that we might want to say, Lord, we search for the positive. We search for the good because good is happening. And Father, we just pray right now that you would go before us, open the doors of ministry that we could touch people, we can impact people, we can make a difference. And Father, I just pray that you would give us a great and blessed weekend, meet all of these needs that were represented here tonight. And Lord God, bring us back here on Sunday, ready to be in your word with our brothers and sisters again. In Jesus' name. Somebody said amen. Amen. Ain't God.